Welcome to the Emotionally Healthy Leader Podcast. My name is Rich Velotis. I'm the lead pastor at New Life Fellowship Church here in Queens, New York City. And I'm here as always with Pete Scazzaro. Pete is the founder of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality as well as the founder of New Life Fellowship Church. And we've been on a series of podcasts um, unpacking some of the themes of the book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. And Pete, last, uh, for the last few times, we've been focusing on the inner life. Yep. Uh, we've addressed issues such as facing your shadow, uh, leading out of your marriage and singleness, or singleness, slowing down for loving union, and practicing Sabbath delight. Now, that's the first part of the book where we are uh, looking at the inner life. Now we're going to focus on the outer life. And to kind of illustrate this, you, you, you have the image on the cover of the book, uh, as well as within the book, of the tree. So why don't you just tell me about yep. um, how does the inner life and the outer life flow with that diagram there? And, and actually, this is the reason uh, I wrote the book in the first place, was my own struggle with connecting the inner and outer life. And so uh, to introduce the second half of the book is this illustration of a tree in part two. And again, the cover of the book is you've got the roots of the tree going down, but the question is how they connect to the upper branches of the tree. And so. For most of my leadership, I would take business practices, best practices out there in the marketplace, and just simply bring them into our church. Mm -hmm. Whether it's strategic planning, decision making, team building, culture, there's lots of great books out there on it. But the, there was always something missing for me because, and I realized because we were just grafting into the tree something from the outside that was not connected mm. to the roots. It was unmodified. Mm. And that disconnect is what for me, the first 20 years, which is such a struggle, I think the whole book was birthed out of, no, th there has to be an integration theologically and somehow out of the roots of Jesus into every planning and decision-making process because we're followers of Jesus. We're not like a, the corporate world. So Pete, just unpack that for me. For 20 years or so, tw you were, um, I mean, you pastored New Life for 28 years. But you're 26, about 26. Then you took over. <laughs> the, the, the grafting, I did. The grafting of business, best business practices, how would that flesh out for you just practically? Yeah, yeah. What would that look like? You read a book by yeah, yeah. someone and then what? Well, let's just take, even, let's just take mis measure of success. You know, and I, I, you know, characteristics of uh, what's that way? Well, standard planning and decision making, how it's done in churches. And I think I just naturally took it over, which was, well, success is more people, more numbers, something I can measure. So numbers, mm -hmm. buildings, budgets, yeah. which isn't bad, you know, it's in the Bible, but it's such a narrow definition. Yeah. And I always struggled with that, right? I mean, Rich, we, if we want to go for numbers, we have to move. We should move out of this place, get a big parking lot, mm -hmm. leave the inner city of Queens, um, because it's going to inform then all your decisions. Yeah. So that would be an example for me yeah. of, uh, or just making plans because we, we can do something, we do it because there's an opportunity, we just grab it, versus what's God's will for us? That's a different question to be asking. Yeah. And I think we go into planning meetings often led by someone who is skilled, who a Christian, who'd learned something from uh, that Procter & Gamble, General Electric, some excellent planning company outside. We'd bring them in, they'd lead us in a process. We'd pray to begin, we'd pray to end, maybe we'd pray at lunch. But I always felt like it's just, something is just not, Right, yeah. and I, that unease or dis-ease persisted for many, many, many years, even as we got into EHS, but finally came to play saying, no, this, this, there's something wrong here. I think we kind of fell into it slowly over time yeah. at New Life, uh, but it was, it, it was like breaking a paradigm yeah. that I felt like I was immersed in since I became a Christian. Yeah, so uh, you talk about in this chapter of planning and decision-making, you make a contrast between uh, the standard practice, yep. and then what does emotionally healthy planning look like? So you list out three things. You just uh, alluded to one of them. Um, but the first one of the standard practice of planning and decision-making is we define success too narrowly. And you said, you know, it's, it's how many people are coming in here, how much money do we have in the yep. bank, and you're saying there's, it's much larger than that when it comes to planning and decision-making. Uh, so you just mentioned that. The second thing you say is, we make plans and take action without God. Come on, no one does that, Pete. Um, explore that a little bit. We make plans and take action without God. Again, because we, we're, again, we're helping people come to Jesus or know Jesus. So therefore, why wouldn't I do it? Well, the question is how you're doing it, the pace you're doing it. And I think it creates a, 
a culture which is, we gotta just do whatever's coming our way. Yeah. Whichever's gonna apparently advance the kingdom. Again, from our understanding of time, advance the kingdom like now. Yeah. And I think, I know, I, I just, con just confess I've made many plans without God, which have flopped. And a lot of that has to do with what, our pace? Yeah. Our pace of life? Our insecurities. Remember I sent you that email when you first became the lead pastor at New Life, and someone sent us both an email about a church that had come into New York and had a few thousand people within like six months. You yeah. Know? And it was like, I said, this is the fourth temptation in the wilderness. Like it's saying you're a loser, Rich. What happened? You've been pastor here for six months. Why, aren't, why don't you yeah. have as many people as they have, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, the, the anxiety. And to feel like, oh my gosh, we've got to do something like now to grow this church. And you end up making plans that are coming from a shadow. Yeah. But again, that's why the inner life connects with the outer life, because you can't do this differently without an inner life with God. Yeah. So we define success too narrowly. That's the standard way of planning and decision making. We make plans and take action without God. Um, and then third is we go beyond God's limits. Now, uh, emotionally healthy spirituality limits is a, it's a massive part of emotionally healthy spirituality. But what do you mean? in the area of planning and decision-making that we go beyond God's limits? Well, again, back, back to, it, it flows out of my understanding of success. Uh, but, for example, I end up getting engaged in planting congregations, which happened to me in the early years, that I didn't, uh, going beyond God's limits, because one, I did not have the time with God I needed. It was now compromising my time with Him. And, because I was involved in too many things, my marriage, mm -hmm. forget it secondary, Sabbath, slowing down for loving union. So in other words, what were the limits God was putting around me as a gift? Mm. Uh, I just, I wasn't even like, to me, limits were to be conquered. Yeah. You know, beyond limits is the limitless. And so that's very standard. I think is go as fast and high as you can, as quickly as you can. And that kind of assumption just caused me to violate limits and causes churches to violate limits and people are stressed out and anxious. Uh, it's kind of standard practice, you know, all over the world. Yeah. And so those three areas there are the standard. Then you, you contrast it by talking about emotionally healthy planning yeah. and decision making. And there are four um, qualities here of it. So let's just take them one by one. Yeah. The first is uh, we define success as radically doing God's <laughs> will. Emotionally healthy planning and decision making is defining <laughs> success as radically doing God's will. What's, what's that like? I know what it means, and I don't know what yeah, it means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had conversations about it, right? I mean, just as, as, which means, what is God's will for our church or our ministry? And defining that clearly. Uh, that takes a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. not like, numbers is easy. You know, we're 200 people, we want to be 250 people next year. Right. Which I'm not saying is a bad, I'm not saying it's a bad goal, but I can, that's, that's simple. But the question is, what is God's will and so, for example, let's take the area of transformation, uh, which for us is a real, you know, a real commitment here at New Life, deep beneath the surface transformation in people's lives. Well, trying to define that is not easy, and we spent right. many, many hours working on it. Yeah. Every ministry has got to wrestle with that. Every parachurch ministry, every local church ministry, every small group. Um, how do we measure success? And, and it's going to probably take multiple conversations, mm -hmm. lots of thought and prayer, we're back to having time for these kind of, but once you can discern, yes, this is it, mm. there can be a real sense of peace. Without it, it's like this, I never know. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, you know, for us, racial reconciliation is a big commitment here for us. That's a, I think we have them intuitively in us. We just don't take the time to actually get really clear as to what they are. Yeah. So radically doing God's will is the first aspect of emotionally healthy planning. Second is creating a space for heart preparation. It seems like this, this theme keeps coming back, that space, um, the pace of life here, yes. the creating space, how does that influence planning and decision making? Well, again, it's, I think what's different about us here and what the Emotionally Healthy Leader is about is we're leading missional churches or, or missional ministries. We're not a retreat center, which they need to measure success as well, or a counseling center. Yeah. Um, we're a church called to reach the world for Christ. So, and I've got to make decisions on how, how we're going to do that. So the question is, I've got to get my heart to a place 
where I'm actually open mm. to whatever God's will is, mm. which is hard. Yeah. And uh, so maybe it'd be good for you to take a minute or two uh, because there's a personal level, and I talk about that in the chapter, and then there's a team level. Yeah. You know, I've got to do it personally in my own life, but also I've got as a leader now make sure my team is in a place. Yeah. So maybe why don't you talk, Rich, a bit about indifference and how we've approached that Ignatian concept of indifference, and then what you've done as a, with our staff uh, to help do team preparation as we're planning and making decisions. Yeah, for, for indifference out of... Ignatian spirituality is not being apathetic. It's not like not being. I don't care about what's what the outcomes are. Uh, indifference is essentially uh, I am opening myself to the will of God, whatever that might be, which is very scary. Um, and in in different planning meetings, we've we've gone around the room as we've been planning and make decisions, especially with large uh, issues before us, going around asking. Uh, what, what percentage, uh, what, 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 a scale of one to ten, how indifferent are you? One meaning, nah, I don't care, I'm open to whatever, ten meaning, or however we, we scale it there. But to, to, to nail that down and say, I am not indifferent, and to just basically say that, it doesn't mean we're bad, it just means this is where we're at right now. We know what we're getting into as yeah. we're making this decision and we're planning. And so that's been, especially around large issues yeah. where many times I... I, I know exactly what I want to do. Whether God wants to join me in that is another story. <laughs> uh, but I know exactly what I want to do. That's really helpful. On a staff level, the inner and outer life, we, we have two large staff retreats a year, uh, one in September, one in January. Uh, but we're really intentional before we get into planning and decision making that we're taking a few hours of heart preparation. Uh, and Pete, you've modeled that for years, and I've, I've followed in that. Because the temptation, is, there's so much to do. The temptation is just to get the flip charts out and say, yes. this is a problem, we need to address this, as opposed to taking a few hours, and not just a half an hour Bible study. We're talking about two, three hours of mm. alone time, community time, where we're, we're trying to hear the voice of God, and then it is out of that place that we're making some specific plans and we're deciding on things there. So that's been really uh, creating a, a space for heart preparation individually as well as for a team. I mean, we, we don't assume, I think the biggest thing is, I mean, I think our staff are all seeking God and our team, but we don't assume we walk into a meeting on, say, it's a Tuesday, you know, retreat, they're all ready to go, like, but I need the time as well, you yeah. need the time, but we'll take a few hours, I think, just to get ourselves centered where, okay, well, at least we're more open to whatever God has than we were when we walked in the door. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's been tremendous for our team, yeah. I, I think. I, look for, I think we all look forward to the retreats Absolutely. as a result. Absolutely. It's not just getting stuff done. It's allowing God to really do something inside of us as well. Uh, third is, you say, praying for prudence. And that's a word we use at New Life a lot as well, prudence, uh, out of the book of Proverbs. But what do you mean by, by praying for prudence? You know, it's interesting. Aquinas did a lot of work on the word prudence. It's really kind of difficult to read, but he calls it like the cardinal virtue. It's like the, uh, it's like the core wisdom virtue mm. Uh, for leaders especially. It's a great word study to do in Proverbs, not being hasty. And so prudence takes into account taking your time, back to this is slowing down so you really gather all the data. Mm. You're really thinking things through. Yeah. What are the implications of this? If we launch this new campus, okay, what does that mean for all the teams? What does it mean for our time? What does it mean for our families? But you're really being prudent. You're getting counsel from people who've gone before you. I mean, you're great at that. I mean, you're, you're, I see you networking with folks all over the country. Um, on different issues, which is prudent, right? Before you're making now big decisions, uh, and it's wonderful because it creates, first of all, as a, now a member of the staff, it's nice to know, feels very safe, but praying for prudence uh, is such a, as a person who has been imprudent mm -hmm. and hasty, um, I think it's a real quality, character quality, we want in all staff on our team. Yeah, and the temptation is to just go without getting all the data, pressure internally, externally, and prudence goes out the window. But the nice thing about it is, but you're still balancing, I'm open to whatever the Holy Spirit says. So it may be imprudent. We had a discussion today about some possible global mission yeah. opportunities for us at New Life and EHS. But from a financial perspective, it's not prudent. We're gonna lose more money. It's, you know, it's a drain. But I think we're all holding the fact of, what is God saying? So we're doing the prudent thing, yeah. but, but you know, as Ruth was talking to staff meeting today, it was like,
but we recognize we're open to whatever God's saying yeah. here. That to me is a beautiful balance versus tipping one or the other. Yeah. And so the finding success is radically doing God's will, creating a space for heart preparation, praying for prudence, and then lastly, looking for God, again, this dreaded word Dang. here, in our limits. Um, looking for God in our limits. So Wow. And I, I would I think limits, I'll just say on a personal level, has probably remained my greatest struggle as a leader in all these years. And Me too. <laughs> I'm glad my wife is on in this on this podcast. And, and and perhaps it is because, Rich, if you think about Genesis chapter two, the issue of rebellion in the garden was about limits. And maybe there just is a it, maybe it's everybody, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, the issue of we just it's it's not even a bad thing, it's a good thing, but you grab the tree. And so anyway, I, I think looking for God in limits, whew, that is like, that is, it's a biblical truth, right? We know it's biblical. Mm. We can preach it. Yeah. But man, like I, I you know, someone told me today about like they want to, they have a big project and writing project, you know, and but Sabbath, you know, I'm going to have to write on my Sabbath because I got this project due. And I wrote him back and said, bad idea. Mm. Well, for more information, you can go on our website, emotionallyhealthy.org. You can also go on amazon.com to pick up uh, your copy of The Emotionally Healthy Leader. A lot of great um, insights uh, to lead in a different way. So hope to catch you next time. Take care.